Okay, so I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Augusto Vaglio, and he's going to discuss the renal and urethral involvement in ECD. Thank you. Thanks very much. So I would like to start from the anatomy of the urinary system, just to let you understand uh, where the disease um, is located and how it affects the, the urinary system. So these are the kidneys. Uh, the kidneys are connected to the uh, main artery of our body, which is the aorta through the um, renal arteries. And the blood that flows into the kidneys uh, is drained by the renal veins into the inferior vena cava. Then the kidneys uh, produce the urine, which goes through the ureters into the bladder. And if we, uh, if we do a, a computer tomography or a magnetic resonance imaging, what we usually see is a slice of our body, in this case a slice of, a, of the abdomen. And this is where the kidneys are. And the kidneys are located in, in an area of the abdomen which is called a retroperitoneum, which, is, which means it's the posterior part of the abdomen, uh, whereas the peritoneum is the sheath that uh, uh, is all around the, the gut. And this is why uh, when you hear about uh, different uh, complications of ECD, you hear about retroperitoneal fibrosis or retroperitoneal infiltration. That means that the disease affects this part of the, of the body, this part of the abdomen, and because the, the tissue that is formed that is due to uh, istiocytic infiltration is usually very thick, very hard, it is able to compress all the structures that we find in this uh, area of the abdomen. Here's an example where you can find, uh, this is a CT scan of the abdomen. So this is a spine, this is the anterior part, these are the kidneys, here you can see the, the renal vessels. This is without contrast medium and this is with contrast medium. And you, <coughs> you can see that this is um, a, a normal scan. And this is the retroperitoneal area on the CT scan, and this is usually where we find infiltration of the abdomen. But generally, the infiltration is not limited to this area, um, but can also affect, as it was shown yesterday, it can also affect the mesentery, the gut, and other places in the abdomen. But the, the infiltration of the retroperitoneal area is what causes generally uh, uh, renal disease, or renal and urethral disease. So again, this is a health, uh, an abdominal CT scan in a healthy lady, and you can see here that the kidneys are free. There's nothing around, whereas in the in patients with a digestive disease, this is a very typical manifestation. So we still don't know why. There's probably something in the renal capsule that attracts the histiocytes, and generally the, the, the area that is infiltrated is the area around the kidney, and because the, this infiltration has an irregular pattern, this is what is usually referred to as the hairy kidney aspect. But as I, as I mentioned before, um, this infiltration is not just there and doesn't cause any harm, it, it does cause harm, it does uh, compress and because the infiltration is not only around the kidneys, but it is also around the first part of the collecting duct, which is called the ureter, it can compress the ureter, and so the kidney suffers because the urine cannot progress. This is another reconstruction of a CT scan where we see the two kidneys in a healthy lady and uh, the, the two kidneys in, in, a, uh, man, in a man with ECD. You can also see that there's another difference. There's not only the tissue around the kidneys, but inside the kidney, the, the density of the signal, so the intensity of this white uh, to, to, to gray scale, uh, 
is totally different. You can see that there are more gray areas. And this is urine that, uh, that is retained within the kidneys. And these are the signs of obstruction. And generally, obstruction is, involves this first part of the ureters. This is a very common complication in, uh, in uh, Dimechester disease. Uh, fortunately, this is not always um, a complication that leads to renal failure, renal insufficiency. We usually detect uh, retroperitoneal perirenal infiltration in about 50 to 70 percent of the cases. This is a very typical aspect and this is a very uh, useful aspect also for physicians that can recognize the disease uh, thanks to this kind of infiltration and also thanks to the, the long bone infiltration. These are two very typical signs of the disease. There are only a few other conditions that are characterized by perirenal infiltration of this type. Sometimes we also have infiltration of the aorta and what, it, what is more important is that we can also have infiltration of the origin of the uh, renal arteries from the aorta. Uh, the good thing is that this area is quite easy to reach. You can use a needle and you can do a biopsy. And we usually do the biopsy uh, using simply uh, an ultrasound to guide us in the biopsy procedure. And this is usually a very informative biopsy. And uh, in, in, in our experience, these biopsies are not very invasive. So local anesthesia is okay, and you can get a good sample, and generally these samples include uh, a good part of perirenal tissue. This is uh, uh, like uh, the, the result of a biopsy that was performed through a percutaneous approach, where we see this is kidney, this is the kidney capsule, and this is what is around the kidney. And this biopsy uh, is usually diagnostic and we can perform all the testing for BRAF or other, mutation, other mutations on this biopsy. Overall, to visualize and to understand the extent uh, of infiltration of the, uh, around the kidneys and the functional consequences, we have different types of examinations. Um, and this can be used um, depending on, on what is your purpose. Uh, alternatively or together. Sonography is certainly a first-line examination. It's, uh, it's very good because it's non-invasive, uh, it's cheap, uh, it doesn't cause any harm, uh, no radiation. It's able to detect whether the, the kidneys are dilated, whether the kidneys are suffering, but uh, it doesn't give us all the details that we have seen in the, in the computer tomography. Computer tomography is, is very good to visualize all the anatomical details of the infiltration around the kidneys, the collecting system, the whole abdomen. The problem is uh, that there is radiation and that in patients who have uh, renal insufficiency, the contrast medium that you have to use because a CT scan without contrast medium in patients with ECD is of poor um, you know, usefulness. And uh, so I was saying that if you have a moderate to severe renal insufficiency, the use of contrast medium can worsen renal function. An alternative is magnetic resonance imaging, which is something that you can repeat because there's no radiation. But again, in patients with very severe, but in this case, it's usually very severe renal disease or even in patients with uh, end-stage renal disease, there is a, a, a risk of, a, of, a, of an, an additional disease that can be caused by the use of the contrast medium for um, uh, magnetic resonance imaging. The two contrast media are totally different. The one that we use for computer tomography is uh, iodinated contrast medium, whereas this one is gadolinium. There are only a few contraindications to do MRI. I think MRI is a very good study throughout the body to, to image uh, erdheim chester disease. Uh, the only indications are the allergy to metals, the presence of pacemakers or other metal prosthesis. Then uh, you've heard of the use of PET scans. Uh, 
as a, as a whole body evaluation of the metabolic activity of ovarian chest disease. I think this is a mm, very good technique. Uh, it's able to tell us whether the disease is on or off. Uh, it doesn't tell us much about the extent, the extension of the infiltration. And especially for what is um, the, the, the renal problem, it doesn't tell us anything about uh, renal function. Because you, using PET scan, you cannot tell anything about how the kidneys are. So you can have an idea of whether the disease around the kidneys is on or off. That means that inflammation is there, the histiocytic infiltration is there and is active. So PET scan can tell you whether uh, you, you've been able to switch it off using therapy or not. But it doesn't tell us much about kidney function, about the presence of obstruction. And in that case, we need to combine one of the above discussed techniques, such as sonography, CT or MRI, with renal scintigraphy, which is a good technique to visualize the function of the kidneys. These are all imaging tests that we use, that we combine in different uh, ways to understand how the disease affects the kidneys, but then we also have a very simple test, which is the serum creatinine, uh, which is a test that we use uh, as a routine lab test to understand what is the global renal function. So the disease affects the kidneys, but also affects the proximal portion of the ureters. Uh, it can be on just on one side, but generally the disease is on both sides. Um, and it, it is different from other types of diseases that usually affect the lower portion of the ureter. So uh, when, once you decide um, whether you're investigating uh, ECD or other diseases, you also have to see which part of the ureter is affected. This tissue that is uh, the typical tissue of Verdine chest disease is located here. And generally stenosis is here. And what we can do to do something non-invasive to relieve this stenosis is to put a double J stent. Double J stent is, is called double J because there's a J here and another J here, which are two systems to, you know, fix it. Uh, and it's a small, very soft tube that allows uh, the flow of urine from the kidneys to the, the bladder. Although many times, uh, it's not very easy in, in patients with a digestive disease uh, to, to have a complete resolution of uh, obstruction using stents. And then stents are external, um, uh, are, are foreign devices anyway. Um, so they can cause irritation, they can cause infection, they can cause sometimes discomfort. And they need to be substituted every four to six months, sometimes every year. There are different types, but generally the, the, the complications that are related to the presence of stents uh, are, uh, are the same. Now, uh, in the last few years, some particular type of stents called the double J, same, same structure, tumor stents have been developed. Uh, so these stents have a duration of about six to 12 months. They have an, a reinforced internal layer for resistant to compression, so the, the part that, that is more resistant corresponds to the, to the portion of the ureter that is more affected. Then you can use that, it's more resistant, it's stronger, and it's called tumor stent because it's usually the type of, stent, of stents that we use when we have a tumoral compression of the ureters. Another technique one, once you have a, a compression of the ureters and obstruction of the kidney, is not to drain it by inside, but to drain it by, uh, the skin, by a percutaneous approach using nephrostomy. So nephrostomy involves a percutaneous uh, puncture of, of the kidney. But again, this is an external device, and you need to live with that. Uh, it can cause complication infections, irritations, uh, bleeding sometimes. Uh, 
And I, I think just for the quality of life is really, really bad. But in some patients where st when stents don't work, when, when you have uh, too many infections, when you have a, a reduced renal function, in selected cases, we have to uh, prefer nephrostomies. Here you can see a CT scan where you have a nephrostomy tube, which is the, the white one that you can see goes through the skin uh, inside the kidney. But uh, this is all we can do by uh, technical, pr technical procedures, by interventional procedures. But we have to, to keep in mind that we have a disease and we need to treat the disease. Therefore, the, the therapeutic approach to the renal and urethral involvement in a digestive disease is based on the combination of the interventional procedures and medical therapies. And as you can see here, when we treat a patient effectively, this is the initial picture before therapy and this is after therapy. And I think you don't need a radiologist to understand that all this tissue is reduced. Not only the tissue is reduced, but also the collection of urine that we find in the, kidney, in the kidneys is reduced. And the overall renal function is better. And this was achieved using your, the, the stents, where you can see here as white spots and effective medical therapy. Of course, this is like the best scenario we can have, but still, if you treat effectively, you might have this kind of resolution of this kind of partial remission of retrograde neo infiltration. But if you have a disease that is a long-standing disease, if you haven't relieved the, the obstruction on time, uh, if you have developed um, a chronic damage to the kidneys, then your creatinine can go up and you develop chronic renal insufficiency, which is something you don't, uh, you know, you, you can't resolve. But there are many degrees of chronic renal failure. It doesn't mean that if you have a creatinine of two, you need to go on dialysis after two years. Or if you have a creatinine of three, you're going to get to, to enter dialysis after one or two months. So the prognosis of patients who have a moderate renal insufficiency is very, very difficult to establish. And we have a number of patients who had an obstruction of the ureters who developed chronic kidney disease, but still, once they are treated and they, the stents are used and all the devices that we can use are appropriately managed, then their function remains stable and no one cares if, if you have two of crea a creatinine of two, you will survive and your quality of life will be okay. So renal diseases are very strange because in other organs in other systems once you have a disease you have symptoms you have clinical manifestations for kidney diseases uh, unless you have symptomatic infections unless you have bleeding when you have a chronic uh, renal insufficiency of mild to moderate degree you have no symptoms at all this is surprising but still it's a very important disease and you have to do the best to avoid the progression to end-stage renal disease. So if you have, uh, if you've been unlucky and you've developed an end-stage renal disease, you can't do anything and you have to start what is called a renal replacement therapy, which is the dialysis. And we have two main types of dialysis, the hemodialysis, which is the one that you usually do in hospital, and the peritoneal dialysis, which is the home dialysis. There are many differences between the two. One is that from when you are on hemodialysis, you use your blood vessels to take the blood. The blood is purified through a machine, and then you return the blood to the patient. Whereas when, you, when you're treated by peritoneal dialysis, you have a tube that goes into the peritoneum, so into, the, into your belly and the a fluid is um, is infused inside the belly and then is drained back that is more uh, convenient for uh, if you if you have a um, life if you want to keep your life dynamic if you want to uh, not to go to the hospital every other day as is required for hemodialysis 
but in patients with a dying chest disease who have a, a diffuse infiltration of the, of the abdomen, sometimes this is not possible. And then there is another option, and the, the, the final option is uh, uh, renal transplantation. And recently, because now we, we know this disease much better than we used to do in, in the past, because we have patients on therapy for a long time, we, we've been consulted for uh, patients regarding patients who are on the transplant list. There are basically no contraindications for renal transplantation in patients with a digestive disease. You have to keep in mind that the transplanted kidney uh, is put here. Here are the native kidneys, and the transplanted kidney is generally put here. And you have to uh, um, do the, uh, to, to connect the vessels, of the, so the artery and the vein of the kidney with your iliac vessels, which are here. So we need to be sure that there is no involvement uh, by erdheim chester disease of these arterial and venous trucks. I don't know if it's clear, but the disease usually affects the periaortic space, the pericarpal space, the perirenal space. So we, theoretically, we have space for a kidney in our, in our body, and the transplanted kidney should not be attacked by the disease again, although there are some, some caveats to this. Then patients who receive a renal transplant need to undergo immune suppressive therapy not to reject the transplant. So there, there might be issues uh, in this type of therapy for patients who already are on therapy for a Chester disease. But again, there is no major contraindication. There is no major uh, conflict between uh, the drugs used to treat Erdheim Chester disease and the drugs that we use for immune suppression for the transplanted patient. It's a very big issue. I mean, it's a very complex uh, uh, topic, but, and it, it needs to be discussed case by case. Finally, uh, two more com one more complication of uh, the disease is the involvement of renal arteries. This is the aorta, these are the, the shadows of the renal arteries, and you can see here that the, the, the tissue, the Erdheim chest disease infiltration is all around. When you compress the renal artery, you may have two main consequences. The first is that less blood arrives at the kidney, so uh, the kidney suffers, and it's uh, called ischemic nephropathy. So when you have a ischemia, it means that the blood flow is reduced. So you can this can add damage to the damage that is already done by obstruction of the ureters. And the second consequence is that your blood pressure can go up. And so if you have an uncontrolled hypertension, as uh, Dr. Kutiot said just, just uh, in her talk, you can have high blood pressure in about 50% of patients with ECD. Uh, and this can be a cause of severe hypertension. So if you have an uncontrolled blood pressure, have your renal arteries checked by an angio CT scan or an angio MRI because they can be treated. Uh, if the artery is compressed by the perivascular tissue, uh, you can do um, dilatation using a stent and that can help in the control of hypertension. Thanks very much.